Today we're going to talk about uh, getting started with Rhino, and this will be kind of the first installment of um, videos that where we talk about um, the beginning uh, steps of kind of modeling in Rhino. And uh, so in this video, we'll start off with just starting Rhino. Uh, you should be able to access through your uh, applications, and uh, we'll begin Rhino. And you'll notice when Rhino starts up, uh, it will have a list over here to the right of uh, recently accessed files, things that you've been working on. Uh, there will be an option for a uh, new model uh, where we can open up a new model or uh, other option. And then there's, along with the recent uh, file, there are also template files. So uh, on a PC, this may be just slightly different. It'll open up and I think usually those template files will be listed here, but you'll have uh, options. So if you knew that you were going to be building something that was um, uh, of a certain dimension or certain units, um, you could go ahead and select uh, the appropriate um, units. So let's say we we're building a house, you know, you might be working in feet uh, and inches, but in large objects. So that will expand the size of the grid that, that uh, Rhino has uh, present. If you are working with something, um, you know, at the jewelry scale, you might be choosing, um, you know, small objects, millimeters. Now, right now, um, for most of the tutorials that we'll be doing, um, your your units won't be critical unless the tutorial uh, specifically states that. Um, when it comes to working on what we're going to be doing for major projects, it will become very, very important that you are aware of the units that you're working in. Now, you can always open a template folder and change the units um, at a later time. Um, but if you want to just start off with um, the units that you're going to be working with, then you can select it from this area. The reason that units is important for us in terms of uh, digital fabrication is the fact that every machine that we will be utilizing, whether it be a vinyl cutter, uh, laser cutter, or 3D printer, requires specific units based upon the software that's running it, that running that particular piece of machinery. So that's one of the main things that we'll be teach. I'll be teaching you in this course is um, how to output the various things that you design to physical objects and you know when I first learned Rhino the um, dimensions were probably not as as critical in the fact that everything we were designing was staying in that virtual space and so we were a little careless probably I would say uh, with with thinking about units um, one of the reasons I've asked you to get a, a pair of digital calipers um, is that having a pair of digital calipers in front of you while you model um, will help you visualize what that object is uh, or how large that or small that object is in real life. And uh, that's something I want you to be well grounded in is thinking about the relationship to modeling virtually, but then also uh, outputting this as a physical object. Uh, so again, just be aware of that. Um, I'm just going to click on um, uh, large, well, actually we'll do small objects millimeters. We'll just go with that and, and, uh, and we'll say new model. All right, now Rhino will open up and one of the first things I want to point out to you is that it will tell you right here at the bottom of the screen what units you're in. We're in millimeters here. And so while we're here, I just want to show you how to switch. If you decided that you needed to be working in a different uh, unit, you can um, go to File and Settings. And this is this has changed on um, the Mac version. Uh, in the past, you would go to Dimensions, and there was a Dimensions tab down here where you would change this. But on the new version, uh, you can go to Settings, and it will bring up a Units uh, uh, option. Uh, so again, if it might come in as default and in, into annotation styles or grid or something. But if you click on units, you'll be able to choose from your various units. And you'll notice 
Rhino uh, gives you a ton of options, right? It even gives you light years and parsecs, right? Uh, and I think in the, in the beginning that was kind of, I'm, I'm not for certain, but I think that was kind of a joke in the fact that it didn't really matter what units you were in because you could switch back and forth easily. But again, it will become important for us in terms of digital fabrication and actually fabricating some of these things. If, if you design something um, and, uh, you know, you want it to be a specific size and you had chose, chose the wrong, the chosen the wrong units. Um, you know, I might go to output on my laser cutter and it will not actually physically fit on the machine or it's too small. Right. So that's why it's very important to know. I'm just going to keep millimeters. Um, and if you do select one of these, it would ask if you want to change the units and give you a warning before you actually do it. So that's where that's located. Um, on the Windows side of things, uh, there's a little gear. You've got a little, uh, in your standard tab up here at the top on a Windows version, you've got a little gear, and that gear will, will let you access those uh, settings. I think you could also type in settings, and it would bring that up to change your units. So, um, again, that's just kind of the layout of the program. You will notice, um, as I start to move around in the perspective view, you can see my X and my Y change. That's because Rhino uses a grid system and uh, so it's it's following where that's at in within the grid if i turned on my top top view and made it active you'll notice that it starts to calculate again down here in this right hand corner it starts to calculate where i'm at in space within that okay all right now we're just going to talk a little bit about the various uh kind of areas of of, of rhino so um the first thing i want to bring your attention to is that Rhino uses uh, viewports and it use, it shows you it's unique uh, in terms of the CAD world in that it shows you four viewports at one time uh, and whatever happens in one of these viewports translates to the other uh, viewport. You can maximize the viewport by double clicking on the tab for that viewport. So if I double click, uh, so it's a double left click, uh, it brings my, my top view into full screen. Uh, it's still, if you drew something here, it still would translate to my other views, even though they're not showing right now. If I double click again, it will give me back my four views, double click. And then I can also do the same thing right here. So Rhino always gives you two or three ways to do the same exact thing. So if I wanted to go to my front view or my perspective view or my top view, I can do that just from this top tab. Or if I want to return to my, uh, my, um, four views, I can click this. So either double clicking or backing out, you can, you know, select it there. So that's a way to kind of um, navigate uh, between the various uh, viewports. Um, I think we talked about this in a previous video, but you, I right now I've got my object properties viewport. So if I had drawn a specific uh, object, let's say I clicked on this, I've drawn that object and right now it's not showing anything in my, in my objects property view, but if I click on this object and select it, uh, it will then give me the properties. It'll tell me what layer that object has been drawn in and it'll give me a, um, more information about that object that we have selected. And you'll notice if I select, if I click off of it with a left click, it turns off that object object. If I click on it again, it turns yellow, meaning that it's selected. Now, right now I have gumball turned on. We'll talk about that at a later date. I'm going to turn that off just for time being. Um, PC users, that would be down here in the bottom if you had that on. Um, but I can click on this object and then I can even grab a hold of it and click and drag and, and move it around to different locations once it's selected, right? If I want to deselect, again, I mentioned earlier, you can click off of it. I could also, if I had it selected and I hit escape, it will also deselect it. So hitting escape will deselect so that you're not, it's not highlighted any longer. So um, that's kind of the, the layout as far as the object properties window. You will also notice that the line right now is black. Uh, this line, when it's not selected, is black. It's black because I've drawn it in the first default layer, which is the colored black. So if I were to switch to a different layer by clicking on this um, circle right here, if I drew another circle, that circle you'll see is red, right? So that allows me to, the layers view allows me to select which layer I'm drawing in. Um, I could click on 
my black and see in the object properties uh, window that that object was drawn in the default layer and then it, it's black object. But if I wanted to switch this to maybe the layer two, you'll notice when I deselect that that is now purple because layer two is my purple layer. But whatever layer is clicked right here, it will become the active view. So, you know, if, I'm, if I've got my red layer on, we are now, anything we draw with that clicked will be red uh, and, it's, and, and be in the, in the uh, layer one. Uh, if I wanted to hide those objects, uh, let's say I wanted to hide the red objects, I'd have to click into a different layer and then I could turn the light bulb off. There's, those objects are still there, they're just not viewable. So uh, that allows you to uh, hide a particular um, layer or objects in that layer. Uh, if I wa did wanted to make it to where I could not move these or select these and drag them, I could lock that layer. So now if I try to select that, it does not let me do anything to that layer. So that's the little lock. If I can, if I want to edit those, I can unlock it and then I can grab a hold of it and do something to it. But if I wanted to lock that, I could just click the lock layer, the lock the layer um, button, and uh, it would allow me to um, isolate those and not not edit them. So that's your layers uh, pane or, or window within the, our larger window. Um, all right, let's go ahead. We'll talk a little bit about um, object snaps. So object snaps are very important to allowing us to draw things um, and make sure that um, we can access certain parts of a, uh, an object that we've drawn. I'm just gonna maximize here so you can kind of see, and I am gonna unlock my red layer. So uh, I'm drawing in the default layer, so this will be uh, black that this is drawing in, but um, if I had drawn a line and then I hit enter, that will basically uh, end that command by hitting enter. And so, uh, because previously if I had that long, same line, it's it's looking for the next point of the line. So I could draw like that if I wanted to, right? Now, if I wanted to come back and continue drawing on these with another line, I would want to make sure I had end turned on because then when I go get near it, near that object, it will want to snap. And that's why this is called an object snap. Basically, you turn these various object snaps on for where you want to click onto that line. So, for example, we have in turned on, so I could click then and make sure that when I make another line that they are truly joined end to end. Now, object snaps can be very dangerous, especially near. Near is a very bad object snap to keep on. Because I could come back, I'm going to delete that line, and if I had near turned on, I could snap anywhere on that line. You'll notice there will be a dot, and I'll think that I am on the end of it, and then I click. But when you zoom in, you realize they are not meeting end to end, and this is messy uh, and will cause you great headaches later on if you don't learn to draw in the very beginning using object snaps and making sure to not have near turned on unless you need it. So, uh, you know, my typical O snaps that I leave turned on are typically end and mid. Um, I sometimes will leave um, quadrant on, and those are just real convenient to be able to use as drawing tools. So, as you begin modeling, especially in this first week, I want you to pay very close attention to object snaps and what object snaps are turned on or turned off. So um, let me just show you an example of quad. Quad will want to snap to a quadrant of a circle, for example. So you could, you could do the four quadrants of this circle, right? Um, I could also, you know, mid. Mid's going to basically calculate the midpoint between you know this end and this end of a, of a line segment and let me draw off of that so um, again those three are kind of my main ones center is very convenient let's say I wanted to place a, um, a square at the center of this circle if I turn on center 
I'll pull out. And this is counterintuitive. You think you want to place it here in the center, so you think you want to you want you want to click somewhere there. But if you pull outward, it'll snap to the center, and it lets us place that um, square where we want it uh, based on the center of that circle. So um, that one you will want to turn on and off uh, frequently uh, as you're using it. Okay, so that's your object snaps. Um, uh, bar and again on a PC that will be down here in the lower uh, portion of your window. So just uh, again make sure that you're uh, always turning near off. That's kind of a, every every Rhino user has made that mistake in the beginning um, of having near turned on, and um, soon discovered that they they had issues with their drawings. Um, then at the top. You'll notice we have grid snap. If you have grid snap turned on, I'm just going to show you what will happen. Anytime you draw, it will only let you snap to a grid line. Now, this is sometimes really convenient if you're trying to work with uh, very precise measurements and you know the spatial distance on those grid on the grid. This will allow you to draw very uh, geometric, uh, kind of grid-based uh, uh, dimensions and uh, can be quite convenient so but it, sometimes it's frustrating if you accidentally have that on and you're trying to draw access a different point and your O snap isn't working it might be because grid snap is turned on and your object is not located on a grid line so keep that in mind ortho uh, will draw things orthographically with each other planar will keep things flat and planar that's also sometimes good to turn on and off i usually don't use ortho much uh, smart track will let you uh, basically work on alignment of various things. Um, it, it's and I don't like to have it on. I'll turn it on so you can kind of see here. But um, you'll notice that it uses this white line for helping with alignment. And we will do an exercise later on where that'll be quite useful. But it it, it kind of helps align things up with what it thinks you might want to be trying to line up as you're drawing. So anyway, uh, smart track. Um, I would leave off most of the time. Gumball lets you move things around. We will have an exercise specifically about this, but it lets you move things. So it lets you move things in a very uh, organized one singular direction by either dragging the red or the green arrow. It lets you scale things in one dimension. I'm going to undo that by hitting uh, Control Z or Apple Z or Command Z. And um, I can do the same thing in the, with the green box, right? I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. If I hold down Shift while I grab one of those boxes, it scales everything uniformly. So that's a neat uh, uh, quick key to be able to, to uh, remember is that sh holding Shift while you're dragging either the red or the green box for scaling. And it also gives you an arc for allowing you to rotate things. And I can hold Shift to snap it in a um, vertical or horizontal position, right? Or I can leave shift unselected and just alter it that way. So that's a neat function. There are many other functions we'll talk about with Gumball, but again, uh, if you select something, Gumball will then be active if it's selected in that menu. Again, it'll be down at the bottom for PC user. History lets you record things, um, so you can actually make modifications as you're making multiple multiple selections and multiple commands. It'll record that history, and then if you go back and you alter something at the beginning, it'll update. Um, it's kind of a generic version of a, uh, of what you might find in a parametric modeler, but not nearly as useful. Um, and uh, I would say for most Rhino users to keep history turned off until you absolutely need it. Um, and, and advanced users will, will start to use it a little bit more, especially when you're modeling something where you want to make subtle edits to it. All right, so that kind of shows you everything up there. Um, uh, let's see. This is what turns on your object uh, properties. You can actually uh, access here as well if you want to eliminate, if you need more screen room, you can click on that to do that. And um, you also get your O snaps. You can have that on a, a, a little drop down. So again, just different places to access the same information. Okay, and then this shows you what layer you're drawing in. And we can eliminate, if we want to turn off that sidebar to have more screen room, and then access object properties from here, 
uh, O snaps from here and layers from here, we can do that. So it just depends on how you want to kind of um, organize your your uh, drawing viewports. Um, all right, so now that we have that, we'll talk a little bit about the command bar. So the command bar is where um, we can just start typing commands. So Rhino um, is based off of AutoCAD. So if any of you have learned AutoCAD in the past, um, you can use the same shortcuts because AutoCAD was developed before the existence of a mouse. And so uh, those same kind of key commands will work in Rhino. Uh, if you'd like to use it. So sometimes there are certain commands where I just type the command. So if I wanted a circle, I can start typing it. It will try to auto find what that is that I want, and then it'll give me my options for how I can draw that circle. Um, so it's really convenient. You do not have to click in here and then start typing. You can be out here and just start typing. You know, if I said I wanted, um, you know, I wanted to rotate something. I can start typing RO and then there it is, rotate, and then I'm able to access um, the command that I want. So that's very convenient. Uh, so that's just one example. So let's, uh, again, if we were going to do circle, I can just type that and it'll pop up. Now, let me show you a couple other options. Now, Rhino gives you for the same command, we've got an option for an icon that is a circle. So if I click on this, it gives me the same options and I can select from those options. If I want to show you that in another, a third place you can access would be under curve and we have options for circle and it gives me the same options. So if I wanted to eliminate having to give it what that, the way I wanted to draw that circle, I could go ahead and access it from this menu. But again, um, a, you get th pretty much three different ways of kind of doing the same thing. Uh, so it's either from this top bar your icons or just typing the command. So those are kind of your three methods for inputting, um, you know, what you want in in the program. So um, it's kind of I would just say that you'll you'll get used to accessing these in different ways. If if you're if you kind of like the visual uh, language that Rhino uses, you may get used to using these. You'll also find that there are even uh, callouts. So if you write um, or if you um, whoops, let me back up here. If we look at these little uh, call out um, options down below, you'll see each one of these has a little arrow on them. So if you left click, you're going to get the main command. Um, whereas uh, a lot of times if you right click on these, you'll get another option for those. So um, just kind of pay close attention to that. You don't, it's not something that's a huge issue, but um, it gives you different options. Um, all right. Let's go back and talk then a little bit about navigation. So in the top view, you'll notice uh, that I am uh, able to magnify or blow up kind of the, or zoom in using my scroll button. And this is why I had specced out and told you the first day of class, you really need to have a three button mouse. No matter if it's a cheap um, PC mouse you hook up to your Mac or whatever, um, of, of an inexpensive, uh, three button mouse is essential. If you're trying to draw with a trackpad, um, you may be really good and used to using a trackpad, but there are many times where you need to click multiple buttons at the same time. Um, and the three button mouse is really essential for that. So this is scrolling in the top view. I'm going to show you what a right click and drag does. That allows you to pan. You know, maybe you want to pan to a different area. You can do that. Um, and then right click is going to allow you to select things. So I can either just select individual objects. I can do a click and drag selection window. I'm going to show you. I'm you'll notice that I am uh, selecting from right to left, and when I select from right to left, whatever I touch will be selected. But let's say I select from and drag from left to right instead of right to left. You'll notice that it will only select whatever is fully inside the box. So do pay close attention. That's a very useful tool for selecting things. Um, so the difference between um, right to left click drag and um, left to right versus right to left. Okay, so um, so that's an option for that. So now let's go to our other menu. So I just double clicked on my top viewport. The same commands you'll notice even when I just start dragging. If I right click and drag, that's panning. Right. If I zoom in or out that works the same way so it pretty much does the same thing i can select things 
with the left click. But if I go to my perspective window, I want to show you a difference. In my, in my perspective window, if I take a right click and drag, which would normally pan, you'll notice instead that it rotates uh, around the, the kind of central axis of Rhino, which is this green and red line showing us where zero zero is. And so that will allow us to rotate in space. And um, if we wanted to pan, I would have to hold down shift and then I could right click and drag and it will allow me to pan. Zoom still works the same way. Selections still work the same way as well. So there's our right to left. And here's our left to right. I can still select things individually. I can hold down shift and select multiple objects. If I wanted to deselect one of those selected objects, I could hold down command and click on that singular object that I want to deselect. So you want to make sure you're getting used to using these basic commands. So I want to just make a video just covering how to kind of navigate the space of Rhino and, uh, and how uh, its, its controls work. I think if you can learn this, and that's really one of the main goals of this, of this first week, is to learn how to navigate Rhino. Um, and it's good to practice. The more practice you have, um, the easier the weeks are going to be uh, you know, moving through the new information that we cover. So just kind of be aware of that. All right, one last thing that we'll talk about is up here at the top. I want to talk a little bit about uh, how Rhino categorizes um, how the objects it creates and so you'll, you'll notice that you know in the rhino menu we've got stuff about the program and then we've got file options right now this is where you're saving um, and where you're importing and exporting typical of most any program whether you were using you know adobe or word uh, software uh, edit is going to be allow you to edit uh, specific objects or layers um, it allows you to uh, join and explode and trim and split 2D curves. Um, and then view gives you all your options for how you can view various things. Now these, a lot of these same commands can be, uh, for the view, can be accessed by uh, uh, right clicking on a viewport. You'll notice you get the same options for different types of viewing. Uh, when you right click on those. So that's the same kind of access point as what we're seeing right here. There are some additional ones though as you can see. Alright, so that kind of covers the basics there. Now as we start talking about Rhino, uh, one of the first things that we're going to be doing in the first week is really focusing on 2D drawing. 2D drawing, uh, very similar to how you would sketch uh, on a piece of paper, is, is really critical for learning uh, how to um, draw things in Rhino that then prepare you for the 3D kind of component. And that's the part I know a lot of you probably are, are really excited to get to because that allows us to build three-dimensional things. But 2D is the built are the building blocks of, of the things that we're going to learn later on. And if you can master those, you will be a far better modeler, um, 3D modeler, uh, if you uh, really get a handle on the 2D operations. So the 2D operations in Rhino are referred to as curves. Now this can be quite confusing. When I was a student first learning Rhino, I, I kept thinking, well, a curve is something that's curvy, but you'll see a line is actually considered a curve. And what I mean by that is that basically this this line has no thickness. You'll notice in this in the other views when I have it selected, it basically um, it you know it's not it has no thickness in the sense that it's dimensional in any way whatsoever, three dimensional in any way whatsoever. And so, um, it you know the, I think once you kind of get over that idea of like a curve uh, being something that's actually curved, um, and that it, instead it represents two dimensional lines that is very very helpful so this is where we're going to be working for the first week is just creating um, different types of of um, lines uh, or curves um, that make up our designs for our 2d designs that will be vinyl cutting and um, and laser cutting so uh, this is kind of the building blocks of laser cutting and even some cnc milling and routing uh, really only requires curves you, even to make three-dimensional things uh, it's kind of confusing, but um, that's all you really need to be able to build 
some uh, very complex objects that are three-dimensional with the digital fabrication equipment that we use. So um, getting a, a strong foundation foundation in this is very, very important. Now, um, as we move through Rhino, um, the next main menu item is Surface. Now, Surface, I'm just going to draw a surface and kind of show you the difference uh, in a surface. So I'm, I drew a surface, and you'll notice immediately after I, I clicked here and I clicked here, and you'll notice I've got this these, these small, thinner lines across it. Now, that's called an ISO curve. Rhino creates an ISO curve that represents um, kind of the, especially on a surface or poly surface, it represents um, the uh, um, object and what space it's taking up. So it's kind of confusing right now because we're looking in a wire uh, wireframe view in this particular viewport. We are in the others as well. But if I change my viewport uh, style to shaded, you'll notice that now we see this full surface that the ISO curves are, are following. And so uh, this is my typical layout. I usually work in wireframe, 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 and then I work in shaded here. Some people will work in rendered. I think that's um, it's very labor intensive for your computer to work in the rendered view. It's also hard to see what things are. Uh, so I uh, typically get used to looking in the shade of view. I'm gonna go ahead and show you a few others. Here's artistic. We'll take a second for it to show so you can kind of see what that looks like and there's pin and there's arctic which is very similar to render there's ray trace which is for rendering later on which we'll talk about uh, there's x-ray ghosted so anyway i usually work shaded um, it just is it's less labor intensive for the computer to handle and uh, it allows me to, and i only do this in the in the perspective view i keep the other uh, views in wireframe it just makes it easier for selecting objects later on so again uh, surface uh, has no thickness right you can see that from this other views I've selected the object it has no thickness so this is not 3d printable even though it's a three-dimensional object in rhino that surface has no thickness and it would if we exported this to a 3d printer it wouldn't be able to really calculate um, what that object is because there is no surface now solid you have various options for solid but let's go ahead and draw an object that's very similar corner to corner but you'll notice that it's going to ask for also a height so if we look at this object now we have something that has thickness so if i select this you can see in the side view there is a thickness to that object and um, you know we can even turn on gumball and we could give it more thickness right just by using gumball so this object is considered a solid now what's a little confusing about rhino is that um, it's Rhino is considered a surface modeler, so it's really drawing with surfaces. So if I take this box, and I want to show you what happens if I explode this box. If I click on a specific side and I move it out, you'll notice that it is empty inside. It is not solid. So Rhino creates solids by taking multiple surfaces that touch edge to edge to edge to edge to create what it calls a solid okay that's very important to note for later on when we start working with um, three-dimensional objects I just went and control Z uh, or command Z uh, twice there to back up but that is the idea of a solid that basically it's made up of multiple surfaces uh, that make up the whole solid that touches, uh, you know, edge to edge. I'll turn gumball off so you can kind of see that. So keep that in mind. I think it's quite useful uh, to think about. Again, um, if we wanted to just kind of see, we could do ghosted and we can kind of see through that object and see, see the other views. Um, again, we could do artistic and see what that looks like. You can kind of see. And um, so just want you to be very very conscious of the difference between a curve a surface and a solid because that understanding that will make you a better modeler uh, in the end um, and so uh, just be aware of that now a mesh i'm going to show a uh, draw a mesh primitive and show you the same thing so let's do a box for it 
and I'll switch to a different view here and we'll draw it. And this will not be, um, you, you can kind of get a sense of what a mesh is. A mesh is basically, uh, it takes and creates that object out of multiple polygons. So there's multiple polygons that make up this whole object. Let's show you a, a sphere, the difference between a sphere that is a solid sphere. So kind of similar to this, we'll do a sphere here. So there's a sphere as a solid. And let's do a mesh sphere, show it to you. You'll notice that it's multiple vertices and the mesh is pretty, um, it's kind of dumbed down in terms of the number of vertices. So the fewer the vertices, the more faceted it's going to look. And um, when we 3D print later on, we will be taking a lot of our solid models that we create or our three-dimensional models that we create and converting them to meshes to be able to 3D print them. And I usually explain the difference between a mesh and a solid in, the, um, uh, in a correlation that, that goes along with photography. If you think about um, shooting photography, or shooting, shooting a photo, you probably, if you're going to try to get as much information as possible, you're probably shooting in a raw format that you're getting as much information as possible. But then when you upload that photograph to, let's say, a, a website, you are not uploading the full raw data set. You are actually compressing that image into a JPEG right uh, file type. And so it's a compressed file type. So in some ways, a mesh becomes a compressed file type. Now there are modeling programs that work in mesh only um, and um, and play with they play with the density of the meshes. One of those is ZBrush, one is uh, Sculptress, which we will talk about at some point during this semester. And those uh, programs um, and also Mesh Mixer by Autodesk, but those programs are allow you to edit meshes. But meshes are typically kind of crude lower um, resolution files. So it's not a it's not a file type that I think is all that good to work with in Rhino at least from the get-go. It might be uh, in the means to the end later on, but uh, for editing things in other software, which we will talk about doing, but when we first are drawing things, we'll be working with primarily curved surfaces and solids to be able to manipulate those things. All right, now the uh, other options we have are uh, dimensions tab. So our dimensions tab has a lot of ways to measure things. So we could we could use this tab. Let's say we wanted to measure the length of uh, the, the edge of a box, this box. We could take the dimensions, say linear dimension, click have our O snaps turned on, right? End and end, and we could drag out. And we could see that that uh, box is 44 millimeters, 44.83 millimeters across that edge, right? If we had something that we wanted to measure on an angle, we could go to dimension aligned dimension and we could click here and click here and we could figure out that that length of that object is 13 millimeters. So I'm just clicking on those points, dragging out and clicking again and it, it locks that down. And that's its, its own separate object. So I can uh, click on it and then delete it if I don't want to see that. Okay, so we can click on that and delete. So dimensions tab lets you measure different things. I could measure the diameter of my circle over here. So I could click on that and it would give me that diameter. That's a diameter of 13.02. So those measuring tools will become quite useful as we're checking things and making sure that files are the right sizes for output to our digital fabrication um, equipment. So just kind of be aware of that tab. Transform allows us to uh, scale and rotate things. We can also mirror things. So we could draw a portion of something and then, you know, mirror that. We could uh, orient or align things with each other. We can array. We'll be talking about arrays um, actually here soon in one of our first exercises. So um, these are all tools that you'll be uh, learning to use to kind of modify, right, or transform uh, objects you've drawn. Uh, tools let you access different things, right? Your um, object snaps are listed underneath there. Um, there's also scripting options. There's a, a plugin called Grasshopper, which we'll be talking about later on the uh, toward the uh, third week of class, or third or fourth week of class. So um, these are a place where you can access those plugins that Rhino uses, which are basically third-party um, programs that run within Rhino. Uh, Analyze lets us 
also analyze properties. We can figure out the mass of something of an object. We could figure out, you know, area, volume, um, things like that. So we're able to kind of analyze the things we've drawn. And then rendering. Rendering allows us to um, add materials, realistic looking materials to things we've drawn. This is another major component that we will be focusing on during this class that will allow you to um, create photorealistic objects uh, that don't even really exist that we've just drawn virtually in Rhino and, uh, and uh, we're able to uh, use in a variety of ways. I use this a lot with um, clients. If a, a client um, asks me to make something for them, I can spend a lot of time making um, the actual object, but it's far more um, uh, beneficial to model that object, render it virtually, show that to the client, and get feedback before I try to make something where they might want to be they might want me to make multiple changes to that object um, and that would be uh, time consuming and uh, material wise be costly so um, this is a great way that you'll you'll learn how to make um, realistic renderings or jpegs uh, uh, or tiffs of the various things that we model and then uh, window just lets you access uh, you know the, the actual rhino window and and um, and then there's also a help menu. The help menu in Rhino is quite um, uh, easy to use. Um, you're able to type things in. I'm going to show you another option which I really like in Rhino, and that option is right here in our panels view. Right now, I have my layers view under panels selected, so that's showing my layers that we talked about earlier. Uh, we also have notes we can make. We have um, blocks. Uh, we have our history. It shows our history of what we've done. What we've drawn so you can kind of go back and look at the very beginning what we what we did um, and then uh, you have your display panel it talks about um, you know how we're displaying our various windows but then this this particular icon this this will help menu this is really helpful um, and what I do a lot of times when I when I first uh, start teaching is I have students keep this on because let's say there's a command you're not sure how you're supposed to use that so let's just use circle as an example you know if I if I click on circle immediately um, when I click on this and then my command is open the circle uh, will show up in help menu and they'll, there will even be uh, short videos on all the various ways that you can draw a circle um, and there'll be information on how Rhino is, is what, like what each one of these options means and how to use them. So I find this really useful for new uh, users to have that help menu turned on. If you're not sure how a command works, this is a great way uh, to access that information. Um, so that's kind of an overview of our viewport. The main things that um, uh, I want to have you take away are really, um, you know, the various methods in which um, we draw. I'm just going to select everything and hit delete. But I want to I want to just recap just very quickly. Let's say um, you know we draw something that is a um, I'm going to draw a, like a control point curve. You know, this is a this is a curve. It has no thickness to it, right? And I'm just going to show you, we can just type on our text here, command, we can say that's a curve, right? And I can blow this up a little bit bigger. So the methods in which we can draw in Rhino are a curve. And then we can do a surface. Right, and I'm just going to show you in this viewport. Oh, real quick too, um, if you're trying to see what where everything is, there's this real neat icon right here. It's got the magnifying glass. It's called Zoom ex Extents. Uh, for a PC user, it will be in your standard tab up at the top. Um, but if you left click this, it will uh, bring everything into view that of any object you've drawn. Or if you right click, it'll do all views at the same time. So that's really a neat way to kind of recenter yourself is that little zoom extents button um, and right clicking on it for all views. All right, then our other option is solid. Again, we can right click on that. See that? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just type in our text on these other ones that we didn't do earlier. So I can do surface. 
and I'll make sure this is uh, as larger this time. So we'll say 10 and there's the surface. And then if I hit enter, it'll repeat the last command that I just did. So I just hit, you know, enter and then we'll hit apply. So there's our solid, right? And then we'll do a mesh. We do the same thing here. And so you'll see it's made up of all these little polygons. And so we can click on the text button, say mesh. So there's a mesh. So those are our, our main methods of drawing. I'm going to introduce one last one. She is pretty interesting. Um, and so for this one, we're going to start off with um, a curve. It's similar to what we had done before. If I make that into a closed curve by making sure the ends meet up, let's go ahead and throw in another shape in here. Let's throw a few circles in here. Uh, by the way, if you're ever in a command and you don't want to, you don't want to actually draw the object, you can just hit, you'll see that my command bar is open right now. It's asking me to do something. I can hit escape and it will end the command. So that way you don't have to draw if you don't want to. But I want to hit enter to repeat that command and then click. So the, the last method is if I draw these curves and I see again you'll notice that there is no thickness to this but the neat feature I can do with this is if they're closed curves meaning they meet end to end and they're separate you know individual regions so if I click on this you know this is one continuous shape that meets end to end that is important very very important that's going to cause problems for you later on as I mentioned earlier so making sure that it meets end to end there's no overlap no gap or anything. You'll, I'll, you'll notice that I have multiple individual shapes, but if I take all those shapes and I say solid, extrude, planar curve, straight, planar meaning that these objects are all in the same plane and they are flat, allows me to extrude that object. And so what this is called, you'll notice that I have my original, if I click on this in the top menu, I've got the curve, but I also have what's called an extrusion, right? And this is sometimes referred to as a, um, let's see, light weight extrusion. And so that's what this object is. This is a lightweight extrusion. So these are kind of our main building blocks in Rhino. Um, uh, they are like, you know, curve, surface, solid, mesh, and a lightweight extrusion. Um, real quick, let's just gonna show you, I'm gonna delete that extrusion and show you a few other options because this is really convenient later on. Um, so we go to solid, we go to extrude planar curve, we can even do tapered. So we can extrude that object as a tapered objects, right? So we can reverse that taper. You can see it, I'm pulling down on the right view down below here, and it's gonna give me this tapered angle, right? Or I can undo that, we'll do the same thing again, hit enter and instead of a draft angle of five I'll do a draft angle of ten there's always extra information in here that you can access in your command bar about each command so you want to get in the habit of reading that command bar what does it want you to input information wise now and so you can kind of see um, how we're able to draw that object okay um, I think that's pretty much it for this video just wanted to show you those various methods of um, kind of navigating Rhino, getting used to moving around in the space, and being able to, um, to build things uh, using the basic building blocks of curve, surface, solid, mesh, and lightweight extrusion. Uh, if you've got any questions about this, please reach out and, um, and we'll go over any uh, questions you might have. Thanks so much for watching.